right, I'm going to try to zoom through this. Uh, this is the, um, hopefully if I can get through the rest of this tonight, the last part of his, the history part of Roman Catholicism. And I, I really, as we go forward, and this is the first religion we're looking at, and so I'm kind of still getting my feel for what pace I need to do for uh, the history aspect. And so sometimes I go heavy on the history and I don't get to the doctrine part soon enough. And uh, tonight I'm going to try to really uh, just streamline right into finishing out the history part of the Roman Catholic Church and, uh, and then we'll be able to go on to the doctrine. And that's really going to be more, that should be more of the focus and is more of the focus of, of, what we're do, of what we're doing, why we're doing this. Because we want to have the answers. We need to be people of answers, people with answers. And so I want this to be able to educate you. I also, the doctrinal part of it, I want you to be able to be grounded in sound doctrine and also be able to uh, know, be able to d distinguish a difference. Okay, this is Catholic doctrine or this is Orthodox doctrine or this is, you know, we're going to cover a lot. We have a lot of territory in this series we're going to cover. Um, and, and it's going to go in a lot of different directions of different religions, which I think will be helpful as far as just being grounded and having answers. Because people need answers. And there's so many people who search for answers and they have questions and then they hear something, but they get the wrong answers. Mm -hmm. But because that's who's in their ear and that's their influence, that's oftentimes people get pulled and given wrong information and get pulled in wrong directions. But I want to give you the history here, and this really does tie in with where we are today with Roman Catholicism. Um, the, uh, why is it, what am I doing here? All right, you can't see anything, can you? <laughs> it would help if I would hit this button right here. How about that? Um, so in the history of Roman Catholicism, Pope Paul III uh, set up the Roman Inquisition. Now we talked about the Jesuits a bit last week, but Pope Paul III, in addition to authorizing the Jesuits, he set up the Roman Inquisition, which was similar to medieval and Spanish Inquisitions. And this included the imprisonment and confiscation of property for those who had become Protestant. Uh, millions of, and this is, I'm talking about all the Inquisitions, but there were many Inquisitions over hundreds of years. Uh, but in the time of the Counter-Reformation, that's what we're still focused on, the Counter-Reformation, there were uh, there was um, some similar things going on that that did to the uh, similar to the medieval and Spanish Inquisitions, and just brutal, brutal uh, torture, horrific torture methods were used during these different Inquisitions, uh, and one of the groups targeted during the first Inquisitions were the Waldensians, who the uh, Catholic Church viewed them as heretics, but they were really Bible-believing Christians. But there was just awful, some of the most awful persecution, torture. It wasn't that they just killed people, they tortured people. They tortured Christians and uh, tortured Bible-believing Christians. And so there was another Inquisition set up in, uh, in, during that time of the Counter-Reformation. In, uh, yes? I'm just curious about the time period of Pope Paul. Uh, that was... Let me go back here, and uh, I don't. I, I I just need to get out of that so I can go back to my previous slide that I have hidden, uh, so it skips over it. Uh, Pope Paul authorized the order of the Jesuits in 1540, so it would have been some time after that that he also um, authorized the uh, the Inquisition. What did it do? Unhide all of them now? <laughs> um, and uh, so moving on to some of the other developments, so uh, that we're going to take a big jump forward here. A lot of what, what the Catholic Church has become, what it is today, is the product of hundreds and even almost 2,000 years of history. So what we see is just the development of these doctrines over time. And what some of these actually more in relatively recent. So when they claim to be the, oh, we're this final authority and the authority rests in the church, well, they've changed their mind an awful lot. Or they've had a lot of things added over centuries, many centuries, that you would think if they were the true um, church, you'd think they'd have had all these things settled uh, by now. But uh, when you look at even in 1854, Mary's Immaculate Conception was made an official doctrine by Pope Pius IX. You say, well, that's just 1854. That's not that many uh, years ago. 
not even 200 years ago compared to when we've been talking about Constantine and the 300s and all the other things that happened. But that's where they come back to authority. Where does the authority lie? And they say well, the authority lies with the Pope and that there is, can be new revelations that the Pope speaks on behalf of God. And so that's how they justify these added doctrines that the Pope can just say that that's the way it is. And then these other councils that also decide things. Um, and so the Council of Trent was a big part of the Counter-Reformation. And then these new doctrines were added after the Council of Trent. So these things are happening even after that council. The council of Trent was a very significant council. But during the first Vatican Council, papal infallibility was declared. Pope Pius IX was responsible for that as well. Uh, Pope Pius X and others have declared Mary to be co-redemptrix. Uh, Pope Pius was Pope from 1903 to 1914, so we're really coming up more into recent times. And to be co-redemptrix is to have a part uh, to, in Christ's work of redemption, that Mary had some level of part as, as a redeemer. Uh, instead of just Christ being the redeemer, it's Mary also sharing a part in that. And then um, Immaculate Conception, I, I didn't put in my notes here what that actually means, but it means that uh, uh, Mary was without sin, without a sin nature. So she, um, that, that's, what, that's what Immaculate Conception means. But in, in relation to Mary. Uh, in 1950, Pope Pius uh, twelfth declared the doctrine of the Assumption of Mary, which means that her body and soul were taken to heaven and she didn't die. And so that's probably where you get into some of these things where people claim oh, they've seen an apparition of Mary or kind of like she still just still lives on and she you know, probably appears in different places. But so these things are in recent couple hundred, last couple hundred years. And uh, things that sound normal to the Catholic Church today aren't really that old. But a lot of the doctrine just, in, just gradually, uh, just a gradual evolution in the Catholic Church. Uh, the power of Rome decreased from the late 1700s through World War I. Uh, and so the, it was a time of great change after the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Uh, and so the Second Vatican Council... There, so in light of these changes, so the, um, the, the, where we're going to end up tonight just in finishing is about the Second Vatican Council. But the Second Vatican Council was held from 1962 to 1965. And it was held, it wasn't in consecutive uh, as far as constant over those few years. It was different uh, meetings of it uh, each year. But it dramatically changed Rome's um, I should say just Rome's, not the Rome's, but dramatically changed Rome's relationship with the world. And what the Second Vatican Council was, it was the Catholic Church's response to a changing world. You had more modernism, you had uh, just so many different changes happening in the world. And then when you, had, when you consider the decline of Rome, the, the power of Rome decreasing, uh, in the way that it did through that period of time, the 1700s through World War I, then they needed something. They, they just needed something to happen, something to, to revitalize the church and, uh, and also adapt to a changing world. And so the council is also called Vatican II, but it's a, it was the Second Vatican Council, Vatican II. It was announced by Pope John the XXIII, on January 25th, 1959. In his opening statement, he said, what is needed at the present time is a new enthusiasm, a new joy and serenity of mind in the unreserved acceptance by all of the entire Christian faith without forfeiting that accuracy and precision in its presentation which characterized the proceedings of the Council of Trent and the First Vatican Council. What is needed and what everyone imbued with a truly Christian, Catholic, and apostolic spirit craves today is that this doctrine shall be more widely known, more deeply understood, and more penetrating in its effects on men's moral lives. What is needed is that this certain and immutable doctrine to which the faithful owe obedience be studied afresh and reformulated in contemporary terms. For this deposit of faith or truths which are contained in our time-honored teaching is one thing, the manner in which these truths are set forth with their meaning preserved intact is something else. And so they're saying, look, we're not changing our teaching. We are 
just adapting and we want it to be more influence, more permeating throughout the world. They're figuring out how they could more saturate the world with their doctrine and, uh, and have a bit of re-energizing of their church. Now, the, I mean, things change, and so we have a, we have a Jesuit pope now, uh, Pope Francis, and he's been softening their position on homosexuality and uh, very much, you know, even taking it further and further in, in, uh, with the world. And so you see even more and more like that. But they, they, this Second Vatican Council, Vatican II, was a huge, huge landmark in Catholic history. Uh, as far as how they um, how they did things, they changed more from the just the hardcore, hardline traditionalist way of doing things, to where it was very much you know masses have to be in Latin, and they changed that to where masses could be in the native tongue and and uh, make it more uh, uh, palatable for the people. The three main purposes of the council were to promote revival in the Catholic Church, become more cooperative with those outside the Catholic Church and address the church's relationship with the world. Though the traditional Catholic position was no religious freedom for non-Catholics, they declared support for religious freedom in, at Vatican II. Uh, the traditional Catholic position on the Jews was that they were cursed by God. They hated the Jews because they said, oh, the Jews rejected Jesus, they crucified Jesus. But there was an attempt to turn from the anti-Jewish position, which was met with opposition from Arabs and traditionalists, and so they kind of went back and forth on that for a while, and I don't know if they really came out with anything too profound uh, as far as a change in that. But, uh, but overall, there was the attempt. The Pope at the time wanted to turn away from that anti-Jewish uh, uh, culture that was in the Catholic Church. And uh, there was a renewed emphasis on scripture reading and the development of modern translations. And uh, so that, that's why even t so today, you actually find Catholics more talking about reading their Bible. Because that was, you know, before, you know, they'd have the Bible chained to the palm. You know, they wanted to keep the Bible out of people's hands. So they found it easier. Hey, let's, let's, um, let's have Bible translations. More and more Bible translations. So there are ones that are geared toward Catholics that are published by a Catholic church. And then the fact of the matter is uh, most of the modern, almost all of the modern translations um, are also translated from Catholic manuscripts like Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and, and those, that family of manuscripts. And so the, the argument about readability, and that was what I was talking about earlier with the, the pastor who was teach, is teaching people how to make the translation transition, is what they called it. Um, all of what he talked about was the readability of it. And, um, you know, which is, is, is greatly ignorant. Somebody should know better. He's somebody that should know better that two things that are different are not the same. And so regardless of the readability argument, when you have a, the modern translations, and he, he's a big proponent of the ESV, um, you say, well, what do you do with those verses that the ESV say don't belong in there, or they're missing, or that the, you know, the oldest and most reliable manuscripts do not include these verses? So what, do you, what do you do with that discrepancy? Uh, do you have the authoritative word of God? It's not just about readability. And it's not just about, and he says, I want a word for word, a formal equivalency translation. And it's not just about word for word translation, because if you have the wrong manuscripts to begin with, if you're, if you're operating off of corrupt manuscripts, you can translate word for word all you want, but you're still missing stuff. And, um, but uh, so the, I think it's no, uh, no coincidence that the uh, uniting of religion, of Christianity, so to speak, more with evangelicalism with Catholicism uh, is increasing along with just the widespread modern Bible versions uh, that uh, undermine the authority of God's Word, the authoritative preaching of Bible doctrine. Uh, on the subject of the world, Wikipedia says this. I, I was looking, I like to look at Encyclopedia Britannica, but the article that they had about the changes in the Catholic Church after uh, regarding Vatican II, where it's behind a paywall, you had to register, so I'm not registered with them yet. Uh, <laughs> so I went to Wikipedia, and it was okay. Um, this, this schema, which is an outline, so they, have, they had different, a bunch of schemas during this council, so outlines a diff, uh, number of different commissions on different subjects, and so it was a huge thing, huge thing. Uh, it was a remarkable document 
on the subject of their relation with the world, is what this is referring to, unique in the history of councils. The church, it said, sees itself as a partner in cooperation and dialogue with the whole of humanity. All members of the human family must work together for a more humane world, and that is more what you get from the Catholic Church now and from the Pope, uh, which was not the history that we've seen from the Catholic Church, but that is now more of the focus is, is goodness and love and charity and all of these things, you know, good for humanity, which the current Pope being a, a Marxist, uh, you know, is using that to espouse Marxist principles. But for Christians... Uh, nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in their hearts. The text went so far as to say that the church could learn from the secular world. It was a far cry from the condemnations of the errors of the world that were so typical of church pronouncements. The subject of tradition versus scripture was discussed, and the traditionalists, or the conservatives, wanted a clear statement made that tradition contained revealed truths not contained in scripture. The, the final wording ended up being, the church does not draw her certainty for all revealed truths from Scripture alone. <laughs> um, one major landmark of Vatican II is the statement called Evangelicals and Catholics Together. That was in, I think, 1994, somewhere in the early 90s. So the changes that happened at Vatican II made it possible for there to be such a statement, a document that different people signed on to, Catholics and Evangelicals, they signed on to, that there could even be such a thing. Not all the Catholics were in favor of this document because they saw if they were more traditionalists, they weren't going to be giving up anything to non-Catholics. But uh, it was signed by evangelicals such as Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. Uh, J.I. Packer was a big uh, proponent of it. Uh, it was radically ecumenical. It starts with this in the introduction. We are, we are evangelical Protestants and Roman Catholics who have been led through prayer, study, and discussion to common convictions about Christian faith and mission. This statement cannot speak officially for our communities. It does intend to speak responsibly from our communities and to our communities. In this statement, we address what we have discovered both about our unity and about our differences. We are aware that our experience reflects the distinctive circumstances and opportunities of evangelicals and Catholics living together in North America. At the same time, we believe that what we have discovered and resolved is pertinent to the relationship between evangelicals and Catholics in other parts of the world. We therefore commend this statement to their prayerful consideration. As the second millennium draws to a close, the Christian mission in world history faces a moment of daunting opportunity and responsibility. If in the merciful and mysterious ways of God the second coming is delayed, we enter upon a third millennium that could be, in the words of John Paul II, a springtime of world missions. Um, as Christ is one, so the Christian mission is one. That one mission can and should be advanced in diverse ways. Legitimate diversity, however, should not be confused with existing divisions between Christians that obscure the one Christ and hinder the one mission. There is a necessary connection between the visible unity of Christians and the mission of the one Christ. We together pray for the fulfillment of the prayer of our Lord. You've probably heard this before. <laughs> may they all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So also may they be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. That's the favorite verse of ecumenicals. Uh, let's just all unite because they all want us to be one. Uh, that's John 17. We, we together, evangelicals and Catholics, confess our sins against the unity that Christ intends for all his disciples. Now Vatican II, on the subject of ecumenism, says it is altogether necessary that doctrine be lucidly presented. Nothing is so foreign to real ecumenism as that false irenicism by which the purity of Catholic doctrine suffers detriment and its true sense is obscured. So they said, we're for ecumenism as long as it does not obscure Catholic doctrine. That's, that's their position. And so you have all these evangelicals just, yeah, let's get along, let's go do this, let's, let's just all be one in Christ because... Uh, that you know, Catholics and Catholics are just as much Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ, according to them, as as the uh, evangelicals are. Everybody's together, and uh, that was back in the early '90s. But that's the environment in which we still live today, and it's advanced more um, that. The Catholics are much more ecumenical, but they still know, know in their minds, 
we are the true church. It's just we, we're more open to everybody coming back. Come back home. Come back home. And that's, that's what's happening. And uh, people are falling for it left and right. Um, so that's where we're going to stop. We'll stop right there. And uh, that's, the, we're gonna, that's to the end of the history of, of uh, Roman Catholicism. And we'll get into the um, uh, more of the doctrinal part next time.